Welcome to WGLNA Season 2, Qualifier Number 1. Tonight we find out which team will be joining us in group play. I'm Clutch, joined by Greetorp on the set, along with Randall Rukil Holcomb, a resident expert and also super biased towards Team Simp. Completely <laughs> and totally biased, Clutch. Completely and oh, totally biased. It's great to have you guys here tonight and great for all of you to join us. Thank you so much for supporting esports and World of Tanks here in the North American scene. Greetorp, last night we had to say goodbye to some teams, EC. Uh, Turtle Police, also Pop Stars, kind of an Big upset, surprise. you would say, yeah. Yeah, but going into the semifinals right now, guys, we have two Spanish-speaking teams, both Hunter by Hunter and Casadores are all the way in the top four. What this says is this one team, this Spanish-speaking team is the premier team over there in, of course, South America. You can see Casadores will be matching up against Refuse to Die, Hunter by Hunter, will be matching up against Simpsaurus Rex. Now, where they stand, Casadores is the A team. Hunter by Hunter is the B team in their respect, well, in their clan together. So they're definitely very skilled. They practice all the time together. And it's really, really cool to see two Spanish-speaking teams against, let's be honest, some pretty strong teams that have been showing a lot of success. That's right. And for the branch out of that team actually to kind of not really divide their talent, but spread their talent out more to have two representatives. We saw Simp do that in season one. We're continually seeing Simp do that with Simposaurus Rex. So this is the best way, I believe, to have many, many people be involved and also have the experience of the professional scene. That way your team, your clan gets better and better and better with every engagement and with every tournament. Let's go ahead and talk about the season format of how this all works. Now, we already have eight teams that are in group stage for Season 2. Those teams are Fulcrum Gaming, Simp, Wreak Havoc, Simple Tankers, Scurry Hard, River of Blood, Nerve, and Cunninghams. They come in because of Season 1 and their placement. We have two teams from the Major Leagues 2013 that Wargaming hosted. Those two teams are Burnall Empires and Hammer Time. Now, we had four teams win the regulation matches, which were earlier this week. Those four teams are Simplistic, Cap Fast Nation, Game Over, and War and Peace. This week is qualifier number one, where any team could sign up, and now we are down to the final four. In two weeks, we have the open qualifier number two. Make sure to get ready for registration. Starts Monday the 9th, and registration will close Sunday the 15th. Battles will start Thursday on the 19th at 5 o'clock Pacific time, and we will know at the end of that week all of our teams for group play. That's right. Three ma three matches scheduled for today. Of course, the two semifinals and of course and then the finals. I got a question for you guys. Since we only have three matches, we normally have five. How does doing a couple of tank companies afterwards sound? Get some of the viewers involved. We can just have a really fun time. And uh, you know, I mean, we're used to working uh, a little bit later on. So <laughs> how does that feel? We're used to long days on camera. No, it feels great. P feel free to join us after right, the that. last match, yeah. after the finals. We'll hopefully have an interview with, with the winners, and after that, yes. we'll take a little break. We'll get our tank company set up, and so make sure to start your own tank companies so you can have a chance to face <laughs> us on the battlefield. Well, we need to fill a tank company. So yeah. Let's fill ours. Only the best players in the world. Join so our channel a little bit later on, and then, you know, of course, Form your own tank companies, and we'll just crush We'll get started. I believe we're going to start with mediums, about tier six limits. So oh, that's what yeah. we're going to start at. Medium sounds like good. It's easy to fill, and I mean, yeah. it's easy to find people with a medium tank company. It's probably one of the more popular tank companies, and then we can maybe go to a champion if we're feeling up to it. Feeling a up medium, to it. Wait, yeah. A medium tier six? No. Uh, sorry, champion tank company, which will be tier eight. No. Oh. I think Come about, on. about, I think. With a tank company, you have different sets, and I think two to six is a possibility. Okay. I might not have a medium. You might not have a tier six? Would you sell them all? I yeah, well, I, I just wow. sell them. You'll have to sell care. your IS-3. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> You're a terrible human. Well, man. we'll figure it out, but what's more important is getting through these semifinals and the finals to find Definitely out who's so. going to be joining us at the group stage. Now, a lot of people are joining us tonight that are first-time viewers of World of Tanks or have watched a couple pieces here and there. They saw the event in Vegas, and they thought, wow, what is this? I definitely want to get more involved. And we're going to have Randall break down the rule format of 7x42 since that's a little bit different than pub play. Randall? Yes, exactly. Uh, in 7x42 format, there are seven players per team with 42 tier points to, uh, to fill out your team. And each tank is worth a point per tier. So a tier one Cunningham is worth one point. A tier eight, you know, IS-3, worth eight points. You can fill in the, uh, the middle there, guys. And there's a max tier of eight. So no tier nines, no tier 10 tanks uh, in our format. And every battle is a best of five. So first to three, best of five. Sometimes we have some draws that actually end up making us uh, 
find a victor. And we might want to actually talk about the eight point rule if it shows up, which is uh, at the end of a match, if there is an eight point difference between the remaining tanks, say there's uh, 16 points of, of tanks left for one team and only eight for another, that is an eight point difference. And the winner will be that 16 point team still uh, with those eight points alive over the other. That's how we decide if it's, you know, some games just have to be decided that way. It's just so close. That's why we have the rules set in place, mm -hmm. and Wargaming has standardized those rules throughout the different regions. There's the Korean region, the Asian region, which just recently had their finals. We also have Europe and Russia. Each of these teams have been competing for big prize pools and also to accumulate points for the big finals happening in 2014. For more information or if you have any questions, make sure to follow us on Twitter at WGLNA or go to Facebook at facebook.com slash WGLNA. And finally, to check out the VODs and for more information about brackets and signing up and registration, go to WGLNA.com. We're going to take a quick break. We come back. We're going to get battle number one between Cazadores and Refuse to Die after this. Welcome back to WGLNA Season 2, Qualifier Number 1. Already, Week 1 is almost complete for Qualifier Number 1, and soon we're going to have a victor. Tonight, we're going to find out who's going to be joining us for three weeks of awesome play, and maybe they can make it to the finals. More information will be announced where the finals are going to be. But we do know it's a $100,000 prize pool for the winners. Last, uh, last event, $50,000 was given to Fulcrum Gaming. Of course, one of the big favorites, if you guys are just tuning in to the first WGLNA broadcast, uh, Fulcrum Gaming, just a consistent performer here in the North American region. Behind them, Simp, and we had a lot of other different Simp teams actually yeah. followed through. We've been seeing a lot, a lot of Simp. Today we'll be, we will be seeing another Simp team. That's right. Real quickly, Rue Kill, what kind of positions are we going to see on Abby? Well, on Abby, we could expect, from my experience, Cazadores is the kind of team that will go to the east, and we've seen them do that consistently. On the north side, refuse to die. If north or south, I expect west side, this is going to be a slow match between the two of them. All right, thank you, Randall. Let's find out what's going to happen as we jump into the first battle of tonight. It is on Abby. Here we go to the north side, the red team. It is Refuse to Die. And spawning to the south, we have the Latinos. It is Cazadores. First map on Abbey, gentlemen. We don't see this as a typical first map, but because of the veto process, this was Refuse to Die's choice in order to get on this map. And we're seeing them push to the west. Called it. It's just such a, th uh, a common move for Refuse to Die and for Cazadores to move like this. It's going to be a very slow match. And what do we have for tank selection, Greetor? Three T69s and two 1390s over on the side for Cazadores. On the other side, two 5100s, a Pershing, a T69, and a 1390. I have to say, I really like Refuse to Die's lineup. It really accurately defends against a lot of uh, the things we've seen from Cazadores. And I was talking to a bag of kittens yesterday. And he has studied Casadores quite a bit. And what he sees is, well, you know, they run pretty 1390 heavy. Most of the time they go over the east side. And it looks like he's just looking to outgun them. If there's ever a confrontation, he's going to have the upper hand, especially with those 5100s. Hmm. Well, seeing as he studied Casadores, I wouldn't expect him to go with the west side uh, hold. Because if he'd studied them, he probably would know that that kind of move is working for a draw. So I wonder if he actually wants to get this map out of the way, thinking Cazador is, has has some kind of advantage here. I think that's a strong possibility because of the unpre unpredictability of Cazadores. And this map, with its approach, it's I don't want to use the word straightforward because of Cazadores, not much is straightforward. But it's not a huge open battlefield. And with the type of shutdown power, these two AMX 30, uh, 5100s, excuse me, and one T69 that we have a setup here with some, a 1390 Valkyrie view is kind of scouting ahead. Oh, this Quasar could, be could go down here, guys. Kufo's lining it up. Don't know if he has the shot. He does. He does. Kufo, again, ah. just being so incredibly active. Kind of kind of weird that he just stayed there, that T1 Quasar just stayed there, especially after getting lit up. Although I, I don't know if he has six cents on his T1 Cunningham. So he, I would I would totally assume he does. That's a, almost a staple for a T1 Cunningham to have. You have to have camo. You have to have six cents on your T1. If you don't, 
I, I can't imagine bringing a T1 Cunningham into a battle like this. Although you have to give props to Kufo for calling one of those spots. He drove up almost as if he, he was looking for a T1 right there under the Abbey, That's and right. it just showed up for him. Kufo, one of the best performing light tankers and scouts in the world, I'll have to say. Yeah, Kufo, I mean, you got to be careful with those statistics because I was talking to a lot of players, and I agree with them. It is facilitated by the Casadori's play style. That is, Kufo is going to be that active scout, the one actively looking for their opponents, and not only that, being safe, and extremely safe. So that's why his lifetime is always very, very good. Uh, he's able to scout out a lot of people, have uh, scouting damage, which is basically you scout for people, and then they get blown up by your teammates. So Kufo has a lot of stuff. He knows how to play that style, but it's definitely exceptionally done because I've tried to find other uh, teams that replicate it, and nobody has that, that sheer knowledge that Kufo does in yeah. that light tank. And he's well. also a strong leader. Here we see him again in Season 2 in the qualifiers. His team participated in the group stage. Uh, they were not able to make it to Vegas, but it was great to see their type of play and also a lot of the adjustments other teams had to make because of them, because of their unpredictability. Passing the FGH and now almost J line, we have the 5100s and the 1390 and the T1. Nothing spotted yet for Refuse to die, but they could be setting up a trigger to push in or at least get a couple shots from those 5100s. Big damage dealers here on the mountainous ranges. Oh. And three of those T69s, once they're scouted, these 5100s could line them up here pretty quickly. Hey, Andre, I think I figured out what Refuse to die has done to study Casadores. Casadores, many a time, when they haven't found anything in the north, they will actually return south and attempt to attack west and uh, assume that by process of elimination, they figured out that their enemy is in the northwest. That is where Refuse to Die is setting a trap right now. They're on their enemy's plateau oh, that in the so southwest. Cute. What they're doing is they're actually expecting some kind of return south. Oh, is that spotting? Yeah, those yep. are shots going out. Shots on. going in. It, they could be a couple shots no, in the dark, but they think they're going to be in there. It is blind fire right now. It's very intelligent for them to do this. Just try to hit what they can. But I love that. Setting up the trap. And because of the positioning on Abbey, you're able to, to get those shots on. Let's say you do, you know, a good 600 to 900 damage. There's enough tanks to do that, to just burst it down really, really fast. But no, it looks like, are they going to execute? It looks like they're pushing in. Yep, the two light tanks are going to the front. Valkyrie Vios leading the charge with hired gun and the T1 Cunningham right behind the rocks, trying to scout anything up above the hill. Valkyrie Vios is going to go down the hill. If need be, he will commit to going down the hill to get away from any fire, but the T1 is not able to spot anything yet. Those 5100s up on the ridgeline, setting up for any strikes, for any of those tanks that do pop up over that hill on the other side of the the fly capture area, but nothing yet, nothing yet. And Valkyrie Vios is getting a little bit antsy, along with Hired Gun, to see where is Cazadores? Where are they? Well, they are returning to base because Sapo Pepe has spotted two tanks, and it, it looks like Cazadores is attempting to react to this. They've moved their tanks back south. They've got great cover fire now on their own cap point with uh, Logos, uh, and all of the T-69s, I believe, are getting angles, although there is spotting happening in the yeah. north. Bag of Kittens in his Pershing is spotted out there. And that, that gives them a little bit of trepidation whether or not they fully want to commit all the way back and down to return to base. They know there are some tanks here, and there it is, spotted out. Valkyrie Vewas in his 1390 is going to come up into cap. He was scouted out by Sapopepe. Thank you. T1 Cunningham staying right behind the rocks, fulfilling his dream job of being the point man for his team and still alive. Valkyrie Vios with that 1390. If he gets a side flank on any of these tanks, could light them up if they're committed to try to take down those 5100s. 5100s at the bottom of the hill, though. Slightly up the approach. Anubis and World War II Fanatic trying to line up any type of northern hit from Cazadores, but nothing yet. At the same time, Bag of Kittens and Screenly are all the way to the north in a great defensive position, trying to pop any shots through those rocks at the top of the hill. They were able to see Kufo earlier on. He did hide behind that structure, but nothing yet in the last minute for any spotting. And now three minutes left on the clock. If any team's going to want to try to secure a victory, they have uh, obviously three minutes uh, minutes to do it. But we've seen Cazadores go for the last kill at the last second on this map, securing a victory. They could do the same thing again. Bag of Kittens hit on the tracks. He is, gets hit again. He can't see where it's coming from. Screenly trying to get in front to get some HP sharing going, but he's not going to fit. 
Diakin is waiting to use his repair kit, or he already used it. No, he's. I think he's trying to right. save it right now. Yep. And here Ooh. it is. The cap is going to initiate here. Valkyrie Vewa is taking a lot of damage from that T69 all the way on the other side. Sapo Pepe is going to be scouted out. No, he's still he not scouted. He is now. He's now firing. He is. And he's going to uh, escape Anubis down to 500 hit points. The capture has been started. 44 seconds away. No, they're going to actually get off of cap. Is there going to be a They're retreating. Cap? No. no, I don't I don't yeah. know. I see in the north, I do believe Jonah is somewhere near the cap, but I don't know if he's in the circle or not. Uh, from the minimap, it looks like he's getting really close right now. Well, yes, because, and he will initiate cap. Because of the retreat to the south, those Springly and Bag of Kittens are going to reposition themselves, and they're actually going halfway through the map in the abbey itself. And they're going to figure out, okay, are we to approach from the other side of the abbey to get some shots? That's what Bag of Kittens is trying to do against the T1. Tries to line up the hit. It's a miss, though as that T1 continues to accumulate points on the flag capture. Kufo is on the chase against Screenly. A bag kitten's going to have to choose. Do I continue to focus on the T1, or do I set up an ambush for Kufo coming around the corner after Screenly? Well, as has Screenly, how many shots has Screenly wasted at this point? But don't know yet. I haven't seen any shots from him ring out. Okay. Bag of kittens in his Pershing, obviously not an autoloader. So he's been the one firing towards the T1. Screenly could have saved his shots just to escape. Kufo, but oh, around wow. the corner, bag of kittens scenes. Al Jazim Arabin. And Kufo. Yeah, he does get punished for that. He's down to 989 now. Uh, Bag of Kittens is in a really sketchy situation. And it looks like Logos is actually going to join uh, his friend on Cap because for 19 uh -oh. seconds now left until Cap will be finished. That cuts the time down so much, having two instead of one. Bag oh! of Kittens gets the shot, though, for the reset. Lines it up perfectly right through that archway. Nice shot from the Pershing. And that is going to get rid of the high amount of pressure. But 40 seconds left on the clock. Somebody's yeah. going to have to die for an eight-tier point advantage. Well, Bag of Kittens could be the one to die. He's down to 522 now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little worried because Sapo Pepe did see World War II fanatics. 61 hit points. Stringly trying uh, to get in front of Kufo's him to block the shot. He and does he... block the shot, but, but he gets killed. Kufo right through the doorway. Nice oh shot. My. But can Stringly clean this up? Scringly will go down, ladies and gentlemen. That is a 16-point tier advantage to T8 and actually a T1 as well. So Even more. So good. Cazadores are looking phenomenal so far with that patience play. But again, getting those final shots. Five seconds left to go on the clock. Backward review is cannot get any shots fired across the way on the pond. And it will be a victory for Cazadores in battle number one. Intense play. And Kufo coming through that corner, cleaning up Scringly was very, very intense. You know, Red has refused to die, spawning to the south. The blue, we have Cazadores. What do we have for tanks? Great tour. 250, 100s, two 50 100s, two T69s, and a 1390 on the side for Cazadores. On the other side, 250, 100s, two IS3s, and a WZ-132. Look at that, a Wheezy. A Wheezy on the field, and Quasiar. Not Wheezy himself, moving really, really quick across the way. T69, Sapo Pepe trying to get the shot, but it does not hit. Oh, Sapo Pepe taking a little bit of damage here, down to 1146. So one shot, another shot. Looks like it's blind fired out because it was just uh, the same exact spot where Sapo Pepe was. Of course, that doesn't hit anything. Quasiar simply had to say, I'm under attack, guys. Fire down that alleyway. See if you can hit. That is such a long road, and with those trees in the way, uh, you can actually peek around the F2 corner, uh, where we might actually see, uh, could you clutch, could you go jump to that tank in F2? The F2 tank? Yeah. yeah. One second. Who is that? It's one of the heavies here. All right, that IS3, right there. Through those trees, you can't spot each other. You have to actually have someone else do the spotting. And First blood, T69, ah. Cess 28 takes down Quasiar. Again. That so is, he's, yeah. he's always in a little bit questionable position, in my opinion. Well, Quasiar was trying to do spotting for his IS-3, so his IS-3 could do some damage. Yeah. But unfortunately, Quasiar exposed himself too much for too long. And uh, and you saw Sess doing a very good job of just knowing the enemy was going to pop out on that corner, being prepared, and getting that quick shot off. Uh, just good play by Sess ju just to counter Quasiar. Quasiar possibly being a little bit too predictable. Uh, he probably could have waited longer before his enemy would have maybe okay. become more complacent before trying to do that one more time. Go for the head and the rest of the body will follow. That was that type of example we just saw. Quasiar was the eyes of a bag of kittens. Not able to line up those shots though. Bit of a standstill. In the city side we have refused to die with the heavy tanks staying together and now pushing up towards where bag of kittens is. 
bigger spread from the blue team is one of the two or two of the light tanks are all the way to the south mm -hmm. while the heavies are trying or the t69s at least are trying to line up anything from the edge of the delta village yeah that is kufo in the south spotting ahead for his t1 he is he has about 400 meters of view range even farther with optics and he and logos does not so what they want to do is they want to have kufo lead the way by scouting have logos bring up the rear so they know they can safely put him in a bush without him getting spotted out by something with longer uh, view range than logos so that is that's kufo doing a fantastic job there i'm really beginning to respect kufo a lot more than i used to for his scouting i didn't I didn't think he was, you know, an especially special scout, but the more and more I'm watching him this season, I'm beginning to see his scout play really come out and really impress me. A lot of what he's doing is just so, it's, it's a lot deeper than, than what I saw last season even. That's why the numbers don't lie, Root Kill, and mm -hmm. they, uh, they definitely show a lot more than what is normally on the plate because, of course, we could have just said Casadori's terrible team. They only won one of their matches in the entire season. How could we even give them a time of day but you look at their stats and it's like, wow, you guys are really good. And then you look back and they're not really losing that badly in a lot of their matches. So Here's the setup. Here's the setup yep. for the red team. Refuse to die. Taking out one of the, I the T1s, the IS3 taking that shot. 20 seconds left. Cess 28 going to move around the corner here to see if he can land anything. No, he gets shot himself. 15 seconds left on the clock. Bagakitten simply waiting. Not peeking out, but Anubis takes some so shots yeah. from the other side. From Kufo, he's in perfect position. You can see one shot already fired out. This is good reverse angling, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. Oh, CES coming on in, trying to do damage against the bad kins, but you can definitely see those heat shells not that effective against the faced armor. CES trying to line up the one hit, oh. and it does hit. Nine seconds wow. left. A reset happened. Resets again to eight seconds. 41 tier points, however, is in the advantage. Four, refuse to die. Another reset. Nope, five seconds left. Now nine. One more hit on the bag of kittens, though. He will go down. Three seconds left. Will it be another reset, though, against uh, them? More Jim, shots nope. bouncing. Blue, Blue base, base is captured, ladies and gentlemen. And that's going to do it. Tying up the series. Refuse to die has a nice, fast cap there. Unfortunately, I felt like CES was the big problem. He put his T69 in a position where he was just in front of everybody. Yeah, it... it the bounces, the bounces yeah. from the IS threes too. A uh, bag of kittens that too. holding that, holding that down. And what we saw previously in other matches, we saw sometimes the IS threes peek around the corner and say, "Hey guys, are they coming? Are they coming?" Listen, they're on their way because they need to stop you. <laughs> to, 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 hey, to, relax, to guys. Stop. Yeah. We're coming. Yeah, they're, we're they're, coming. They're on the but way. Um, but that IS three again, the setup in the great position and how they were locked in in that parking, that parking mm -hmm. lot mode to keep obviously their turrets straight ahead. To get any shots from uh, across, but Kufo set up a good shot against that 5100, but it wasn't enough. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, guys, you have to pay attention to the fact that it was a heavy lineup, big heavy lineup, yes. lots of lots of IS3s and stuff. Where Kazdoris had none of that. A lot and more HP, mm -hmm. a lot more damage done in just straight up engagements. And hey, we've all we only had one firefight, yep. if you even want to call that one firefight, which it was a couple shells bouncing off here and there, mm -hmm. and that's it. If you're Casadores, you need multiple engagements. You need to unload every single drum from every auto loader, kiting. Even if two, three, four of those shells hit, you have to account the two IS3s and the 5100. Actually, they had equal amounts of 5100s, I believe. Two yes. 5100s on each okay, side. Okay, so uh, let's go into my screen real quick. And, and we'll just see. The IS3s, they have a little bit more health points, so you have to account for that. If you get one shot on each IS3, you're able to kind of maintain that HP equality. But the big problem comes in the fact that they do more consistent fire damage. Uh, yes, there's better bursts than those autoloaders, but if the IS3s are staying alive for a very long time, obviously they have the chance to really make up all that that lost DPM. Yeah, just getting two shots off is a huge amount of damage yes. for those IS3s, especially with the with how light you had the Cazadores team. And I think that was a very smart play out of Refuse to Die by recognizing the fact that they had so much health and armor against Cazadores and saying, you know what, let's just go fast cap this. They're really spread out. They're in the south. They're in the north. They may not have known this, but they knew that that huge spread. They may not have recognized that, but at least they recognized that they wanted to actually force a fight, a fight that was five on five, which is so difficult for Casadores to defend with such a light setup. It's just, I think that was really refused to that recognizing their advantage and actually being able to capitalize it on, capitalize on it this battle. We're going to take a quick break as the Cazadores will be the ones to choose the next map. Stay tuned. Battle number three will happen after this.
Guys, the Casadores. Yeah. Goes uh, goes to their own beat, man. They do. <laughs> and look at this, Kufo in a WZ-132. This is so unlike him. Going to the water side, and look at that big contestation in the center of the mill. Let's, uh, uh, of the hill, excuse me. <laughs> the mill hill. What do we have for <laughs> tanks, Creed? Two T-69s, two 1390s, and a WZ-132. On the other side, two T-32s, two T-69s, and a 1390. It makes a lot of sense for Casadores just to charge the hill because of the fact that they have just so many light tanks. I'm surprised, though, that they got up there without taking any damage. It's it just such a faster lineup, I'd say. Bringing a T-32 slows your... Actually, that's two T-32s yeah. for Refuses I slows your whole approach. That just ensures that Cazadores can just take that jump, take the hill, with such a faster, lighter lineup. You see, this is so characteristic now, I'm beginning to think, of Cazadores bringing such lighter lineups and then of Refuse to Die preferring heavy tanks, which they feel so much safer in. Light on your feet, dodge the heat, especially from those T-32s. 1390 at the top, Al Jazeem Arabin up there. He's able to scout uh, any and all types of tanks that are close and close to his sector there at a 50 meters. Screenly and Anubis in the T-69s. Hold that out next to the rocks. Not the death rocks or the rocks where tanks go to die, as Ruka, Ruka likes to call it, but actually more towards the pride rock where you present your son after he's born to uh, to the entire village. It's over to the south and over to the east. Uh, you sacrifice it. No, that's terrible. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> I went the wrong way with this. Yeah. I was, I was going That's with more Disney, morbid. more Disney, less Old Testament. <laughs> Logos uh, up in the hillside, along with Al Jazeem Arabin, but no shots fired yet between these tanks that are in the center of the map. Hmm. Well, actually, I feel like Logos has seen a T1 that is quasi are going to the east. This is a part. Well, oh wow, is there going to be hill aggression? If there is, I want to look over there in a second. But I felt like Logos was going to go get a free T1. Well, so like crazy when see. Kufo got spotted, I could see Anubis and Screenly, both yeah. their turrets, turned at the same time and try to lock in a shot against the WZ-132. Nothing landed, though. Uh, well, no, they didn't shoot at all because if any of the blue team of Cazadores know that Screenly and Anubis are down some shells, that could prove to be a push on one of the sides. With the T-32, is going to lock in the defensive position at least. But a shot does ring out. It oh. does not penetrate. No, it does not. I think, you know, with the hit point advantage and also I think overall the DPM advantage that um, Refuse to Die has, I think they could exert their control a little bit more on that western side. There's no reason for them to be uh, this defensive. But Quasi are again in a very tough position. So He's going to go down here in a minute. He's going to go ahead and flank him here as uh, Jonah 2 is kind of keeping eyes on him. But this is a little bit scary as Sepul Pepe. Lining up the shot, getting into position. He is a little bit exposed. And Quasiar. Whoa, he's going to go down, actually. Sepul Pepe, Valkyrie Vilas, in that 1390, is going to shoot out from somewhere. I'm not sure because I'm on the he other was, side. Uh, he was actually in the bottom of the hill about G, G6, G7. He, he recognized that, saw, that uh, Quasiar was going to get some kind of slow. He was going to get slow played out. He was going to get just beaten out 2v1, and he came to support his T1. Very smart. I thought that Quasiar might have been left out alone, yeah. hung out to dry there for a minute, but very good uh, very good for uh, Refuse Sedai there. Good job on them to recognize. Sick bait. That's mm -hmm. what that was. <laughs> this mm. gets the blood pumping for both teams, though, because of that kill. Maybe small, but it's significant. Valkyrie view us around the bottom of this, the hillside. Quasiar falling back more all the way to the east and is going to go around to the north to see what he can see for some more information for the rest of his team. Valkyrie Vuis is not going to be fully supported if there is a complete push on the east side because the T-32s are focused down to the north side. Of course they would be because that's where they think the approach is going to be. Scrimley and Numiso have that on complete lockdown. As the time ticks away, 5 minutes and 23 seconds, the spread for Cazadores and Refuse to Die when it comes to map control is almost about even, but Refuse to Die is pushing in little by little, especially all the way on the east side with Quasiar. Well, they've receded all the way. I mean, as you can see, Kufo over here and Logos are over on the western island, bringing out a shot, not being able to connect on their opponents. Or if they did, they did not penetrate. And Nubis and Screenly still holding the same line. Along with the T-32s, Valkyrie Vuis falling back a bit in the 1390. 
They do see one of the tanks. Shots against Screenly okay. do ring out, and that does hit. Nice shots by Logos there. He is popping out just ever so slightly. He did not, I don't think he got detected. No, he did he, not get detected. Yep. The only one on the map that was seen was uh, out of beam. And, and a bag of kittens is spotted out here. They're going to go ahead and push up. T69s are in position, but they are not. Actually, they're doing a lot of damage here. Bag kittens down to 799 health. Pollens at 1119. But the whole team is moving up. This might be a trap because there's a lot of crossfire over from that western island. Bag of Kittens leading the charge. Well, that final shot did bounce off the tank, which was great for him. Luckily, did not get tracked. Absorbing a lot of those shots with the T32. That's how you want to use it. You want to be a bit of a spearhead when you're going into this because of the viability of your allies in those auto loaders. They're able to sh save their shots, save their HP. They're going to deal some more damage later on. Bag of Kittens now at the top of the hill. Just around the bush, able to see CES 28 and T69. Ooh. And Kufo gets the kill against Hired Gun. Pollens, the other T69, took a lot of hits. 613 out of 1350. Just below half health here. Bag of Kittens is going to hold the line. While to the further east side, one of the T1s, Quasiar, still left alive. And that's going to further the map control and push into the enemy side. Yeah. Or refuse to die. I think refuse to die should just chill out right now as Quasiar is going to proxy spot Jonah 2 over here. Now, this is good because of that. Just get a tier eight, maintain this positional advantage, put Quasier in a position where he can start forcing a cap. Valkyrie Vewas though, in a very open position. Al Aljazim Alabim is putting out one last shot, and not able to connect, 97 hit points. Can Logos try to finish that up? Mm, looks like yes. yes. Kufo actually is able to get the kill there. Anubis and Scringly trying to find any shots open to get the revenge kill, but nothing so far is Popping behind those rocks. Al Jazeera out of beam, barely, barely showing up there. Anubis is trying to go for the shots and the kill. He does get a hit against Al Jazeera. And at the same time, T32's World War II Fanatic and a bag of kittens are moving on Pollens and Cess right now. They're taking oh. huge hits for this, though. Yeah, I mean, their, their holes are just exposed. And now a bag of kittens will go down. World War II Fanatic is up against two T69s that do not have any more ammo. One shot, one kill. CES down to 974 health, but there are reinforcements. Al Jazeem was able to put out a good shot over here. CES down to 754 health. He will be done clipping in about 10 seconds. No, he's done now. And down he goes, World War II Fnatic. Uh, there is a large, large advantage, almost 15, well, exactly 15 tier points ahead. Al Jazeem. Locking it down on that side to the west. And now Flag is under attack right now. Capture a minute and 12 seconds. Anubis gets hit again from Kufo. Kufo getting a shot and falling back with Scringly. Says, enough of this, Kufo. I'm coming for you. Right on the top of the cliff. He's going to slow oh, down. Oh, misses the, the shot. shot. And that is brutal. Oh, no, another shot. Three shots have been missed on Kufo. These are all things excellent driving from him. And it just buys them enough time for Al Jazeem Al uh, Arabin and CES to move up into position. Screenly going to trade a shot. And there's also Logos in that 1390 on top of that lighthouse, putting out damage against Screenly. This is just beautifully done. Kazadoris have this battle in the back. Screenly 644 to the 1350. Oh, oh and Al Jazeem Arabin from behind in the 1390. Slides in, he safes as the um umpire, but Anubis is able to light him up. Al Jazeem focuses on one of them, is able to get the kill. CES 28 and the T69 against Anubis. This will be a fight to the death for Anubis. As CES, does he have one more shot in his clip? We'll find out coming around the corner. No, will he go for the ram damage? He will, but it's only eight against CES. But here comes Kufo and the WZ-132. Not an auto loader, and gets the kill. Victory goes to Cazadores on Mines. They're going to be up 2-1, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take a short break. South side is the blue team. Cazadori is currently up 2-1 and refuse to die. Must win in order to move on to the finals in this battle. They're spawning to the north in the red. And what do we have for tank selection, Gritor? 250-100s, two IS-3s, T-69. And over on the other side, it's a IS-3 for a T-69 flip. Look at this, though. Kufo going straight across the middle, this time in a T-69. Not a light tank, of course. I mean, you don't really bring light tanks to this map. But Kufo now going over. And he might get a really, really fast pick right here. Hired Gun is 
not really exposed because there's a lot of mounds blocking, but Kufa definitely in a very interesting position. I, I do. Indeed. I really like this. This is a really cool move out of Kufo. It's creative. It's unexpected, and it yeah, it's could. in the courtyard, Randall, yeah. which is always a no man's land, as yeah. we call it. It's so risky to do that at the early parts of a match, especially if their opponent was deciding to, you know, actually bring tanks and line them up across the typical position. But seeing as they've gone to a the hill. They're nowhere near where Kufo is, and he could actually get away with this probably yeah. if he finds out uh, after a spot probably happens on the hill here. These guys are probably going to run into, who is that T1? That is Jonah on the hill waiting, and there's the spotting. Oh, Valkyrie Vebos and a bag of kittens were both spotted out, so you can see immediately on the mini-map one hired gun is going to be taken out, and everybody else is pushing forward. CES and, uh, and well, everybody else, Logos. Al, Al Jazim Alabim and Pollens. Yeah, they are all going towards this cap. It looks like they're going to set up to screen cap possibly. And also, it looks like Kufo is going to go T1 hunting as he is going west right now, guys. He is looking for a T1. He is out for blood. It's Fnatic in the 5100 cruising down the hill, leading the rest of his team. Quasiar is able to spot Kufo, screening the IS3, trying to lock down the alternate approach coming from the alleyway. They are able to see one of those tanks. Kufo cleans up the remaining T1. Eyes and ears are now reduced for Refuse to Die. One of the most important things to clean up those T1s, and you can see Kufo really recognizes that cleaning them up really disallows them from doing a counter cap so they can focus all their energy and all their T1s also on just removing this. You can see one T1 all the way in the back. I'm pretty sure that is still Jonah. Yes, it is. He's going to be just that trigger. If he sees any tier eights, they're just going to push on and go for the straight up engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And this is such a great trap. I love this. It uh, is. The Kalashnikovs are, are in control. Yeah, they, they are, are in control of this map. And they're predicting their enemy so well. I, I feel like you're talking about uh, a bag of kittens to study the Cazadores. I think the Cazadores might have studied a bag of kittens. And, uh, and it looks like the T1s are going to begin the cap soon with possibly Yes, and that looks like they're going to have cover from a T69 Kufo, who might jump. Uh, he, I don't know what he's going to do yet, if he's forward or backwards, if he's going to wait where he is. Uh, Sapo Pepe it looks like he's getting ready to begin that cap pressure, and they're even smart enough to leave a T1 at base. If you guys see on the mini-map, there's a T1 all the way to the south. They're not risking their own cap. They, they're keeping that little T1 there just in case. They don't want to get caught out with their with all of their tanks in the north. Anubis taking the most northern approach here across the A line. Going to move up to that corner, see what he can see. Does he? No, oh, he creeps in closer and closer. Will uh, he get a shot? He is spotted now by Kufo. He's the 69, though. Backs off. Cannot get a target line against anything that is capturing. Well, even though it's one tank, every second is ticking by. Anubis decides to push in. And will it stop the cap? Whoa, the tank actually left. It's a setup. It's a trick. Valkyrie Buis and the T69 is under attack. As the other T69, the Bag of Kittens, tries to light up some shots. Anubis is getting hit on his side. Oh. Here come the blue tanks. And a parade of disaster. All of a sudden, Kufo is going to run away as well. He is clipping as he was able to put out all of his damage onto Anubis. Anubis taking out what looks like Al Jazim Alabim. And Pollen's now next on the list. It looks like Anubis is clipping, but Pollen takes a big shot down to 398 hit points. It's going to be tough. Some shots going out from Sapo Pepe in the T1, ringing true against Anubis. Bag of Kittens under attack from some more fire from Logos in the IS3, trying to get away. Refuse to die, it's scattered. Cazadores is moving in for the kill. Kufo is focusing on a Bag of Kittens. Valkyrie Buis is able to destroy the 5100, but Kufo gets the kill against a Bag of Kittens. Screenly is up against three tanks, and he does not have much health left. 680, CES 28 in the other IS3, Logos in the other IS3, honing in their sights, shots oh, fired against shot. him. 304, 735 on CES, and he gets the kill. Oh, nice wow. shot from CES. I'm actually surprised Screenly did not attack there. I, I think he was uh, he was like ammo racked or something, but nice return fire CES being taken down. Anubis down to 132 hit points, though, and Kufo is rounding that corner, and he's going to have a nice big old surprise. Sapo Pepe in the T1 trying to keep Valkyrie distracted as he almost got the one more shot against Kufo and the remaining team members on the blue team, but now they're in for the surround. Three tanks, two tanks on the capture point. Kufo turning the corner. Valkyrie Vios at 52 HP. This will be the last shot. Four refuse to die. Cazadores are able to take it three to one, and they will move on to the finals in qualifier number one. This is a different team than what we saw in season one.
They're just a lot cleaner this time around. Their execution is great. Refuse to Die has been looking good all throughout this qualifier, but it still wasn't enough. Casador is led by Kufo. You can really see how great of a leader he is. On top of that, you can see and how he stresses T1 importance throughout the entire series. He did a great job. Fantastic job. Sapo Pepe, it, it was so small, it was almost kind of funny, but he's still trying to trade blows with any of the tanks there next to the capture point. He's going to go down in one shot, but that one shot is a huge window for any of his teammates to move in and get that kill against that tank. Randall, your thoughts? I thought that was fantastic play on Immelsdorf by the Cazadores. It's just such an excellent trap, and having Kufo in the T69 hunt down the T1s and just destroy them, that tore apart uh, a huge... Uh, equalizer that refused that I had just ripped shreds. No more T1s, only five tier eights left. Then they had a perfect trap set up, completely annihilating a tank in the first few seconds. We didn't even get to talk about that 5100 that got torn apart just in moments as he just came around the corner. Completely destroyed, complete advantage in the Casadores way. I, I think this is a new Casadores team. I want to see them go to the finals, and I think they're new, my new favorite, at least, to go and win this open qualifier. Casadores have been screening or shutting down the 5100s. They did that on Abbey, and they did that again here. The 5100s on the Refuse to Die team, World War II Fanatic, he only got one shot off, 279 damage. The other 5100, though, Anubis was able to lock down a lot more damage, 6 for 8, 1694. But if we take a look at the IS-3, CES-28, 6 for 6, 2100 damage. Right below him, Logos, 1986, 5 for 5. Those IS-3s got the hits they needed. They got into the position that was needed, and they destroyed hey. pretty much any defensive holdout. Kufa know has, knows how to play T69, though. Look at that. Go, go back into this. Look how many kills he has. Yes, his damage isn't that great. He's at five kills. Now, you might look at that and say, well, how does he only have five, have, or how does he have five kills in such low hit points, or, or damage dealt, rather? It's a and finisher. this is finishing blows. That's exactly right. So a lot of these IS-3s are putting out a lot of damage. He's able to just do that finishing blow. Think, you don't want the IS-3 to do it. That's an average roll of 390. You don't want the AMX 5100s to do it. That's an average roll of 300. A T69, though, has the least overkill. It's only doing an average of 225. So if someone has 100 hit points left, you're going to save 100 damage by not using that AMX 5100, not using that uh, IS-3, and just using the T69. Really, yeah. really cool stuff. I actually feel like I want to map out the way Kufo went through that whole match. I okay. mean, if, if I, I feel like I can do this, guys. So right at the beginning, he went right over here across the open. Went and tried to find a T1. It was found elsewhere. He tried to get around a peak, but then he decided not a good idea. Went back around, waited. Once the spot happened on the hill, he went again in for a T1, and then he went back, and he said, and this is as everyone is also coming north again. Right. So as he did that, he went all the way back to the window where he got a T1 kill. Then he went north again, got some great shots on a 5100, and look at this map is a mess right now with Kufo's movements. He goes again. I'm going to change colors because we're going to have to do that. He goes back around yes. after that, and he even comes in to join a fight over here, where then he loops around more to kill another tank, and then finally another tank. And this, this is possibly ignoring other little moves and just driving around. He was everywhere that match, all over the fight in the T69, completely using the mobility of his tank. Uh, fantastic job by Kufo. And the T69 was supporting the whole time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not a guy. Here, I'm going to go to his screen real quick. Um, he, he fired 11 shots. Ten of them were direct hits. And eight of them were penetrations. This is not a guy that's preparing to have the, the highest damaging tank out there. It's a support. He's going into the areas. He's saving his shots, making sure that they're counting at all times. And then just being able to finish a lot of these tanks and have the team just be all efficient. It's, it's just great, great comprehensive play out of Kufo. It's playing to the strengths of each tank. Yeah. And the T69, we dubbed that the finisher. It's called the finisher for a specific reason. And if you need any more clear reason than what Kufo did in that game, you're not going to find it. That's how to play the T69. Yeah. We're going to take a break. We come back. We're going to get match number two set up of Hunter by Hunter versus Simposaurus Rex. Stay tuned. This is the semifinals for the WGLNA Season 2 Qualifier Number 1.